Welcome everybody to our first fall installment of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging uh, webinar series. My name is Mark Remus and I'm one of the Associate Scientific Directors of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And today it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Birgit Pianosi. Uh, Birgit is an associate professor and the former chair of the gerontology department at Huntington Laurentian University in Sudbury. Birgit holds a PhD in psychogerontology from Germany and she's completed two master's programs in human development and in psychogerontology. She is a credentialed professional gerontologist with the National Association for Professional Gerontologists and she is a certified coach for gentle, persuasive approaches in dementia care. Uh, Birgit is chair of the Ontario Interdisciplinary Council for Aging and Health, and she's an executive board member of the Seniors Health Knowledge Network here in Ontario. Birgit is going to be speaking about aging today, opportunities for tomorrow. Before I turn the floor over to Birgit, just a couple of procedural notes. If during the course of the presentation you have a question, please type your question into the chat box, which should be located in the lower left part of uh, your computer screen, and I will read the question to Birgit after she's completed her presentation. If we have time for discussion at the end of the presentation, what's going to happen is uh, our IT expert who's monitoring the presentation will enable the talk feature. If you look at the top left of your screen, there is the talk button. And if we have, again, time for discussion and you wish to say something, press the talk button before you speak, but turn it off after you finish speaking to prevent feedback. So uh, without further ado, Birgit, uh, the floor is yours and thank you very much for agreeing to participate today in this presentation. Well, thank you so much, uh, Marcus. I appreciate it. I, I would like to thank you um, and the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging to be able to do this presentation today. So just for participants uh, to know, I have a very strong German accent, and especially when I'm nervous, it's even worse. So uh, please, if you don't understand some, you know, some things that I'm saying, just again, like uh, Marcus said, uh, put some comments in the in the uh, comment uh, box uh, um, on the bottom there, and I can clarify. I'm not insulted at all. Um, so I am uh, decided to talk about aging today, opportunities for tomorrow, and the reason for that is um, that I always feel that, um, you know, we look at aging often in a very negative way. Um, when I teach gerontology to, to students, I often have um, nursing students and social work students in my class, and they, you know, always are surprised to see that there are a lot of older adults uh, who are actually healthy and do not need to be admitted to hospital or long-term care. So I thought it would be a good idea to, um, to talk to you um, about aging from a positive perspective, but also to give you an idea of what kind of opportunities um, the older generation uh, will give us uh, in the future. So I have divided our my presentation in two parts. Um, I will give you some demographic data, and I'm not a demographer, but um, in order to talk about some of the opportunities we might have in the future, I wanted to give you just a snapshot of um, how aging um, is, um, you know, what the reality of aging is today in Ontario, but also worldwide. And then, as I said, I will talk about some opportunities that we as a society, but also all the adults may have in the future. So let's look at um, the older generation today in Canada, uh, in Ontario. We all know that um, life expectancy is increasing. We will have more older adults in the future. So in 2005, we had about 4.2 million older adults, and that will increase to 9.8% in 2036. From, uh, and that means it doubles from 13.2% to about 24.5%. 
If you just look at um, older adults, 65 years and older, um, we can also see that in 1951, uh, we had about 7.8% of older adults. Um, just on a side note, I'm not calling um, loose 65 and older seniors. I'm, I'm uh, calling them older adults um, as a respect and also uh, to indicate that they're often um, very uh, healthy older adults. In 2006, we had uh, about 13.7 percent, and that is projected to go to 22.7 percent in 2031. If we now look at some international statistics, and I will show you some in a minute, but um, just think about uh, Japan, for instance, who had in 2012, so two years ago, about 23.9 percent of older adults. And we are projecting here that in Canada in 2031, we will have 22.7%. So we're still quite a bit behind uh, other developed countries. Um, so we, when we look at the uh, population 65 to 74 years old, um, we also know that from uh, 1.5 million um, it will, in 1981, it will increase to 2.2 million in 2005. So that's an increase um, by 0.9%. And it might not um, look much, but it is um, quite an increase. So I also gave you here an, uh, an aging uh, population permit. And I wanted to, you to look at, um, that's the uh, one from 2010. I wanted you to look at um, especially the age group of um, 45 and 50. Um, as you can see here, have the, the highest percentage of people in, in the age group. So these are all baby boomers who are, of course, aging as we speak. Um, this is just another graph to show you how uh, the aging uh, population is um, is increasing. Um, you can see here, especially on the right hand side, when we look at the uh, different age groups, the 65 to 74 who are the young old, 75 to 84 are the middle old, and then we have the old old 85 plus. You can see that especially uh, in 2031 and then later in 2041, the old old will have a very large increase. Uh, of um, uh, proportion, um, so we will have much more um, old, old, um, older adults uh, in the future. In order to look at how our society is changing, we also need to look at the natural increase of our population. And it is um, estimated that our population is uh, declining, and that is true for many developed countries. Um, the only reason why Canada is doing so well is uh, because we do have uh, quite uh, a couple of immigrants, uh, like myself, that uh, come to Canada. So as you can see here, in 2096, we had a very sharp decline in, in um, increase, and that could be in 1996 there was quite a, um, a change in Canada, political change, and so um, very, un I remember the times, so it wasn't very secure, you know, there were a lot of things going on, and then we have a, um, a sharp increase in, in immigration in uh, 2001, um, and then we see the decline really uh, from 2001 on um, in the um, in the natural, in the change of the population. Um, but our immigration um, numbers are uh, increasing. So that helps us to uh, sustain um, our population here in Canada. It's very different from uh, some of the European countries where the immigration, um, immigration is very low um, and uh, therefore the increase um, of the um, population, of course, is, uh, is not increasing, it's declining. So we are lucky um, that we have uh, policies that um, really favor immigration. And I will talk about uh, this in a little bit again. So an estimated one of three older adults um, here in Canada were born outside Canada. Um, many have lived here for 35 years or longer. Um, we have about 3% of immigrants who are arriving each year in Canada are older adults, so they often join their family members um, they uh, come to, to, to live with their children, for instance. Uh, many of these older adults who live um, here in Canada and are from elsewhere do speak one of the official languages, but there is about 4% of older adults who do not speak English not. French, and that of course has implications for policies and um, for uh, future um, uh, regulations and, and what we're doing and how we offer some of our programs to our older population. 
The next slide is looking at um, the geographic distribution uh, within Canada. Um, just to give you an idea, and I, um, you know, I'm, I always find it very interesting when we look at Nunavut and Northwest Territories, uh, especially you can see that um, the change and increase in older adults is uh, especially um, pronounced in those two provinces and territories. Um, the lowest change uh, will take place um, in New Brunswick. And um, you know Ontario, Quebec um, has about average uh, change in um, in the um, proportion of older adults. So um, again, the territories, because of of course uh, better health um, uh, policies, um, younger people also moving out from from the territories um, uh, are increasing. Uh, therefore, the older population. So here, um, the next slide is very similar, similar to the previous one. Uh, just gives you another, uh, you know, perspective on um, how uh, many older adults are in each of the provinces, and uh, it's always nice to see a graph um, because it, you know, makes it very clear that, um, especially in when you see here, um, proportion of older adults in 2031 in uh, Newfoundland uh, will be the highest, followed by New Brunswick. Uh, but the change is not as large in those provinces, whereas in the North, Northwest Territories in Nunavut, the change, and you can really see that in the Northwest Territories, that you know the change of uh, proportion of older adults, the increase is, uh, is, is crazy. Um, so they will really have to um, you know, look at uh, policies uh, and procedures and, and see how they can accommodate um, so many older adults uh, proportion, uh, proportionately. Um, the next slide is looking at uh, the demographic uh, dependency ratio, and um, I wanted to put that here because it is still a very much used um, tool to indicate um, how populations or generations are um, dependent on each other, and um, I am very critical um, about this, the use of this um, tool. Um, as I think it does not really reflect reality, but uh, this graph shows you um, shows you that um, the dependency ratio is um, uh, increasing and will uh, in the next uh, years. So as you can see here on the top, um, it's going up. Um, when we look at the younger uh, population, the darker um, line there, the dependency ratio is going down. And when we look at the um, senior, the older adult dependent to ratio, you can see that's going um, up um, again. Um, this is a very controversial um, use of um, displaying um, uh, the usefulness, I think, of, of older adults. As I believe that not everybody who is um, over the age of 65 um, is dependent, and not everybody under the age of 14 is necessarily uh, uh, dependent, but there might be adults uh, with the changes in, um, you know, in education. Um, many adults um, before the age 40 are um, you know, living with their parents, might not have a, a consistent job, um, so they are um, maybe still dependent on, on their parents or grandparents, so it doesn't really reflect reality of today's times. Um, so really, this ratio supports the notion of the rolling tsunami that I'm trying to um, really work against. I, I don't think that we can look at older adults as dependent just because of their age. Um, and that's true actually for any age group, um, but especially for the uh, older adults. So the ratio really fails to account for the benefits older adults bring and, and sees all older adults as a burden. However, it would be much more interesting and a much better predictor to look at race, ethnicity, wealth, um, level of education um, to um, predict um, how uh, dependent a person is. So I really believe that uh, this formula is uh, for today's times. It's not um, a right formula to use to display how generations are um, uh, dependent. Um, Okay, so now uh, let's go to some international uh, um, statistics here. Um, 
some of you may have seen this one from 2012. I just, as I first pointed out earlier, Japan has a, already in 2012 had a um, proportion of older adults, 23.9%, so almost 24%. In Canada, the prediction was, um, when we go back to our beginning slide in 2031, we are predicted to have 22.7%. So even in 2031, we won't even have the percentage that Japan already has at this moment. Um, many of the European countries, of course, very similar. Um, Germany, Italy, and Sweden, followed by Greece uh, and some other countries that are listed here. And then we see on the other side um, the countries with the lowest percentage of um, older adults, and those are, of course, um, uh, developing countries, um, most often in Africa, who have very low um, proportions of older adults, as you can see here, Qatar, 0.8, um, or United Arab Emirates. 0.9%. Um, what a difference. But all of these countries, uh, including the developing countries, will have an increase in the proportion of older adults in, in, the next, uh, in the next years. Let's move on now um, to uh, some other data um, looking at um, labor force. So when we talk about some of the opportunities in a little bit, uh, you know, we have to consider what um, retirement age our um, generally our population has, and if this retirement age uh, is appropriate. Um, it is, has been a discussion for a long time. Should we change retirement age? And it is uh, um, it is changing. Many of the European countries have increased their retirement age to 67. So you can see here that since 2009, uh, the retirement age in Canada has increased um, so from 61.9% in 2009, to, uh, not percent, age, 61.9 uh, to 63 um, is the average uh, retirement age in 2013. When we then look at different sectors, we can see that these in the public sector are still the ones who would retire at the earliest age, 61.1, um, and uh, followed by the private sector, and then those who are self-employed have the highest uh, retirement age at 66.8. So all have been uh, increasing, um, but uh, the public sector employees um, have uh, still the lowest retirement age. And that really raises the question, um, you know, do we need to have a low retirement age? I, I think that we can see when we look at the self-employed, there are probably different reasons for that. Um, financial, uh, probably one, but also when we look at health, um, I believe that all the adults are um, a very healthy uh, group uh, of people, and especially when we look at the baby boomers, and um, we know that they are able to work um, much longer than uh, they're currently in the workforce. And of course, it's very, um, you know, we all would like to retire at an early age, but when we look at when, uh, for instance, a retirement age was introduced, and we know that um, Bismarck, um, he was a, um, a German politician in the First World War, introduced the retirement age of 65 at that time, um, and today we're still using um, that age. So it really, uh, I think the really the time has come that we, we change that because life expectancy, as we all have seen now, has increased uh, drastically. Um, and especially looking at the healthy life expectancy, so people who are uh, expected to live a healthy life um, uh, is much higher than it used to be. So people are able um, to contribute to the society um, until a higher age, and many of those people, of, of those older adults, do, but often in volunteer uh, positions rather than in actually workforce. A full-time workforce, sometimes part-time uh, workforce, they retire and might go back and uh, do some part-time work um, and so on. So housing arrangements, um, you know, um, students are always surprised to see when I, when I tell them about, um, you know, how many people actually live in long-term care and they um, really can't believe it that out of our older population here in Canada, it's only 7% who live in institution. Most of our older adults um, are um, living independently in their own households. 
Um, so that's 93% of the older adults. Out of those, 69% uh, with their families. And then we have 24.6% uh, of older adults who um, live uh, by themselves. This is a little bit different to some of the European trends where um, older adults often live in apartments rather than in homes. And that's not, true, not just true for Europe, but also Asia, of course, of, uh, because of space. Older adults are less likely to own their own home, but rather live in, in bigger buildings. And that, that can have um, also some uh, positive um, implications as they might not uh, live, even though they live alone, they might have a lot of people around them in the apartment building. Um, I recall my grandmother living in, in, in an apartment building, and, and um, it was, I think there were nine apartments, and um, only one uh, was occupied by a young person. All the others were older adults, and they all really looked out for each other, helped out. Um, you know, when uh, one person wouldn't show up one day, they would, you know, investigate what is going on. So they really um, supported each other, and I think that has something good. Um, so they didn't depend on their families, but really um, could depend on each other. So I now want to go to some of the health indicators and, and um, just again to reinforce uh, some of the things that I've talked about previously. Older adults today are a very healthy uh, group um, of people. Um, we can see here the comparison between 2003 and 2011 data, and I just uh, picked a couple of these health indicators that I thought might be interesting to look at. Um, so we can see here that high blood pressure is increasing. Um, it's uh, not surprisingly, when I show you in a minute, that, uh, and I'll go back in the, back to the other slide, but here, then we also see that diabetes uh, is, has increased and obesity also has increased uh, since 2003. Um, so these all relate to each other. Arthritis uh, has a little bit lower percentage or had a lower percentage in 2011. Also interesting to see that uh, immunization in the past year has declined a little bit. And I think uh, some of the reason behind that is that um, not a lot of um, uh, you know older adults might think that um, immunization uh, doesn't have really a benefit. Um, Seeing the doctor has slightly increased, very similar from 2003 to 2011. About 90% of older adults do see a physician regularly. Um, and it's also very interesting to see that older adults do perceive their health as good to excellent, uh, and that's here almost 80%. So that's, uh, and it has increased uh, since 2003. And a sense of belonging and uh, very strong or strong again uh, in the 70% 70, 70 um, and has also increased since 2003. So very, as you can see, very positive uh, kind of attitude towards their own health um, and towards their lives. Um, pain prevention, so even um, uh, preventative activities have increased since 2003. Um, it's about 22% um, who are um, using pain preventive activity, um, less, we have less smokers, um, less asthma, a um, little bit uh, almost the same in uh, COPDs, and then as I said before, uh, increase in diabetes and obesity, um, and that um, I think has to do with, with the lifestyle and our changes in how we, uh, what we do each day and what uh, our, of course, nutri nutrition intake. And these are some of the things that have to be um, watched, I think, for the future because we will have more and more of these um, kind of uh, problems occurring, uh, especially, of course, amongst the um, uh, native population. So now I have talked, and you probably have seen these demographics elsewhere, uh, but I wanted to now um, take a step back and really look at or use this uh, data to, um, to think about what kind of opportunities does that give us um, for tomorrow. Um, so I've talked about, um, you know, we will have more older adults, um, they will be healthier, um, we know that um, many of the older adults who are um, retirement have very good uh, financial um, security, um, many of our older adults, and especially when we look at the baby boomers, are very well educated. Um, they're 
uh, much, much better educated than previous generation, and that is when we look at university education today and college education, we have so many, uh, you know, the majority of, of younger people is, is uh, getting educated, um, so this will uh, even change more drastically in the future, especially when we look at females, um, the education of, of female uh, females is, is really changing and really had an impact on the baby boomers, whereas the generation before that, um, many of the females weren't as well educated. However, even, even though we do have healthier and wealthier and better educated older adults, there are still uh, inequities uh, in service we provide and the support um, we give to older adults and the assistance they need. Um, so it really depends on, um, you know, how um, what kind of resources they have, and it's, it's really, um, there is still a, a very um, a difference, a big difference between males and females. Females are often uh, in need of more services, and, and um, uh, they might not be there, and especially the older adults today, um, where uh, women are still disadvantaged because they don't have the retirement plans that uh, males often have, and because they don't have the education that their new counterparts had. So policies promoting an economic growth, uh, redistributing income, influencing individual behavior, such as um, you know getting more flu shots, for instance, um, but also to get educated, uh, even better educated, eat healthy. Um, also, to alter the demographic age, uh, age sex structure will have an impact on our future. So what we do, how we um, what we give to the older or to the to the adults today is we um, have jobs for our for our adult population um, for males and females, and if we um, give them health promotion and uh, educate them about how to live healthy, then we will be able also to create a much better older adult population in the future. And of course, we know that there are still financial risks associated with health care, long-term care, and pension income. So there are, uh, you know, we need to look at how can we um, change some of these things. And we can discuss that in a minute um, when I'm done with my presentation. Maybe you have also some ideas on how to do that. So why should we be optimistic about the change, and why is it great to have more uh, all the adults who are healthy, um, and it's not considered to be a tsunami, but rather something positive to look at. Um, well, first of all, we, due to uh, the declining fertility, we have much more women uh, in the labor force, which is great. Um, so it gives our women uh, better opportunities. They are uh, better um, educated, as I said. Um, they also are uh, financially um, more secured when they retire because they, they take part in the labor force. Having fewer children means that they are, the ones that we do have are often healthier, they are smarter, and they are better educated children because we can afford to send them to, to schools and, and uh, educate them. Demographic projections indicate further gains in longevity, including gains in healthy life expectancy. So not just living longer, but also living a healthy, long life, um, and that is really uh, expected to, to increase in the future. So we will have a, a compression of morbidity where we do get sick, but um, probably only in the last couple of years of our life, uh, and that's really what everybody wants. We don't want to be dependent on other people for a long period of time. We want to stay healthy, be independent, and then get sick and, uh, and pass on. And it might be um, uh, necessary to increase our legal retirement age and change uh, the pension policies um, to entice people to work longer and to be involved. But as I have said before, even though older people might not be involved in the workforce uh, specifically, they do volunteer and contribute in many other ways um, that might not be um, you know, outlined in some of the demographics we looked at before. So um, Robert Butler said, many healthy older people represent not a liability, but a great asset of experience, skill, drive that a country should learn how to exploit. So we should really look at the older adults and see 
um, what they can do and um, use their um, their knowledge and their experience and um, use it to advance our own um, societies. And they want that. They want to feel needed also. So what are some solutions? And as I said, we can talk about that in a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Uh, the first one is really when we look at policies and we, we use demographic data, we need to make sure that we use the correct, um, correct data. Um, so using a dependency ratio as we have done in the past, I don't believe is, uh, is useful. I think we have to look at um, our um, dependency ratio in a much different light. And I, I will give you in a minute um, a couple of websites you can look at that talk about some of the changes that should be considered when looking at the dependency ratio. So we're using this measure to say, you know, older adults, we have more and more people who are dependent, but we don't um, change the way uh, we measure that. Um, so not everybody 65 and older is dependent, um, and not everybody um, in the age uh, group of um, working age between the 15 and 65 are um, independent. Um, so it's important to look at um, the ratio and make some changes to that. Um, it's important to emphasize the generational interdependence. So not one generation is dependent only on the other, but I think that generations generally are dependent on each other. So we can't live without all the adults, and all the adults can't live out without younger people. We need to really look at how can we benefit from each other. And I think that really needs to, um, you know, we need to think about that really through social change. Um, we need to, to change our thinking. Um, we need to support better education. Um, you know, I just read in the paper today that the uh, tuition fees will increase even more in the next couple of years, and that's really unfortunate. Um, you know, how can we promote uh, better education when the education system um, or education, university and college education is so expensive? Um, you know, we look at other countries, for instance, Germany, where I'm from, education, higher education is free. Um, students don't have to pay anything except for registration fee, which is $100 a year. Um, so that really shows you how um, societies put emphasis on um, on different things. So education um, in Germany is considered very important. Um, so people do um, get to go um, free, uh, no matter what their financial situation is. Health promotion, I think we, we have uh, began to really look at health promotion uh, in the last couple of years, but we are, um, you know, a long way, um, uh, there's a long way to go. Uh, we really need to focus more on promoting health rather than dealing with the issues when they are there. And that really uh, needs, again, we need to, to start thinking in different ways. Um, us as individuals, but also as, uh, as a society. And then we, we need to look at financial security for all, and that is especially true, I think, for females uh, and older older women um, of today, but also for uh, generations to come. Um, you know, we can't have inequalities. Um, people should have the same uh, security no matter who they are and where they are from. So it's really important that we, we make a change, make a change in our thinking, um, and it needs to happen today. We can't wait anymore. We have, you know, procrastinated for uh, for years, and even though we knew this will happen, I've shown you the um, percentage of all the adults in some of the European countries and in Japan. I mean, we knew this was coming. This is nothing new, um, but it is not a tsunami. It's something to look at in a very positive way. We can benefit from having more active, healthy older adults. So here are the two websites I uh, mentioned earlier um, that talk about the dependency ratio. And I think um, if you would like uh, the slides uh, to have sent to you, you can do that. Um, you can check them out. It's quite interesting to look at um, you know, how can that be um, re-evaluated and how can we make changes to um, the dependency ratio that we're using at the moment. 
So thank you so much. That was my presentation. I really would like to um, to open up the floor for discussion. This was meant to to provoke in a way. Um, I want people to to think about some of the demographics and, and some of the um, implications that may have on our aging population. Um, and so um, I don't know, Marcus, if you uh, want to. If you're opening sure, the thanks very much for, your, for the presentation. Very good, very informative. And yes, so uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to use the chat feature to type uh, your questions. Uh, if anyone would like to make a comment, maybe you could just type in the chat so that we know, and then our um, IT person can uh, activate uh, the talk feature. Uh, I've got uh, one question, and that has to do with uh, labor force participation and healthy aging. So we talk about healthy aging as being positive uh, and a good thing. Are there any indicators that we can glean from the labor market in terms of age, healthy aging? So are people staying in the workforce longer because they're more healthy as they get older, et cetera? So I'm just wondering, um, I guess, does the labor market and labor force participation tell us anything about healthy aging? And uh, what might be the implications of healthy aging uh, on the labor market? So I think um, I, I remember one study that's now a couple of uh, years old that looked at um, one of the uh, reasons why um, older people uh, decided to retire or not. And it was interesting to see that, um, you know, one of the reasons was um, uh, they might not retire because of financial reasons. Um, they might retire because they, they're, you know, they feel um, that they are not healthy enough to work anymore. But uh, one very important um, uh, thing was that they actually indicated if they could work um, not full time but part time and in a much more, um, you know, regulate their own working hours, um, they would actually uh, consider to stay in the workforce. I think that we have to rethink about how we offer some of the, the jobs to our older, older adults. Um, I mean, they are. They have been in the um, in the um, um, in the workforce for so long, and or you know, older older women might uh, decide when they get older uh, they didn't work, and they now have time because their children are out of the house, uh, grandchildren growing up. Um, they have the time they would like to participate, but they are unable to find work. So I think we have to be more flexible in how we um, promote some of our jobs and, and um, to not to, you know, put everybody in the same kind of uh, a box and say you have to work from nine to four. Um, and that would, I think, increase the the, um, the workforce of older adults. I don't know if that, uh, if that answered your question, Marcus. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have a question uh, that was typed in. And by the way, uh, the talk feature is open. So if you want to make a verbal comment or ask a verbal question, go right ahead. Uh, but after you've asked the question, please uh, turn off the talk feature. Um, someone wants to know, uh, was body mass index over 30 used to define obesity in both 2003 and 2011? And this individual is also uh, asking if uh, Dr. Payette, that's Hélène Payette, would consider them obese. So um, Hélène can type in her answer or, or talk, but uh, Birgit, do you know anything about the BMI? I actually don't know, but that's a, it's a good question. I hope they use the same index, uh, but I don't know uh, what they use to define obesity. I can find out. Maybe stop Thanks. Let's can um, she's still there? Okay. Uh, here's a question. Uh, it's in the chat. I'm going to read it. With so many older adults aging in place, why do you think there is a belief that long-term care is an inevitable part of aging? How do we change that stereotype? Yeah, I like that. That's. Uh, I, I think we, we we really don't. Uh, 
it's it's a wrong I think it's it's a yes, it's very true, it's a stereotype, it's a misconception. I think older adults in the future will not be living in long term care. The majority of older adults as they do now will live independently. I mean we know that the baby boomers um, you know, are healthy, independent, um, they want to live in their own place, they want to choose where they live, they will not move into long-term care if they don't have to. Um, and even if they are sick, I think there will be other um, opportunities and options for them out there, you know, maybe shared housing where they support each other. Um, and I don't know why we're, you know, thinking that we need to create more long-term care. I really think that's not necessary. That's a, we need to put more emphasis on home care uh, because people want to stay at home and we know that they're healthier if they stay home, and they're happier, uh, they recover easier. Um, so it's, it's, I really like that question because I think, um, you know, it really shows the ageism we behold in our society that we believe we need to put them into institutions uh, when they no longer can live independently or even before that. I don't know if the person who wrote that has a comment on that. Uh, I'm not sure it was somebody from the CLSA's National Coordinating Center. So. Um, if they have follow-up, uh, they're certainly welcome to present. Um, and oh, sorry, Marcus, and I think uh, because the question was here, how do we change that stereotype? I think that yes. we, um, you know, we need to. With a, I hope that with talks like this, um, introducing more and more people to healthy aging, um, you know, we can, you know, one by one, hopefully, um, show us, you know, um, people that. Uh, our older adults are very different from generations before and, and so we can combat some of the stereotypes that are out there. Uh, and we all can do our part by, uh, you know, living healthy lives and, and uh, showing others that as we get older we are, um, we are healthy and we are independent. Great. Um, you mentioned uh, in your response to the question that more and more seniors are choosing to live independently. Uh, is that in part because, well, maybe let me rephrase the question. Why is that happening? Is it because healthcare has gotten better, so they're staying healthier longer and thus can maintain their independence? Or uh, are there other factors at play? We talked about the built environment, uh, making it easier uh, for people to get around age-friendly cities and stuff. So is is it not just healthcare, but is it also things like age-friendly initiatives in cities that provide people with the ability to um, remain independent? Oh yeah, I think Marcus, you made a good point. I think the environment is very important. Uh, I mean, this, uh, age friendly communities uh, and initiatives are very important because we, I mean, we provide environments in our cities not only for the older adults but for any age group uh, to be safe. So, and I think it's a mindset, you know, in, in um, our baby boomers are very independent and when we especially we look at women, um, you know, they are now well educated in the past, um, they didn't have as much education but now they are educated, they want to be independent, they have their own, you know, very successful careers. Those women will not let other people tell them what to do. I think we're, uh, you know, we still think that we can be paternalistic and say, you know, I believe you should be in long-term care. Uh, they will say, no, no, I'm not. I will be living alone or I will be living with a friend, um, you know, after my husband passes away and, and uh, I will, you know, I'm refusing to go into long-term care. I want to be independent. Um, and it, as I said, there can be very different models of how we, you know, how those older adults um, will live. Um, you know, they might share a house together or they, you know, live with younger generations. Um, and it could be friends. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a family because families live so far apart. Um, you know, when I, I, I always, I like to, to, you know, when I talk to my students, I always give them an example of um, older women um, that I experienced um, in Germany when I grew up because during the war, of course, most of the men were killed. So we had, uh, you know, I never had grandfathers. I had two grandmothers and um, they were, because they had to, they were very independent ladies. They would, you know, have never, 
ever, um, you know, they, they raised their children, they uh, worked uh, full time all their lives until, you know, they were about 70 years old. Um, they never complained and they lived independently in their home and until they died. And, you know, they had apartment. one had an apartment, the other one had a home. And I think that's the generation we will see now, you know, women and in Germany it was due to the war because there were women were left, uh, so they had to be more independent. But I, I think we will see more of these kind of women in the future. So that will really impact how uh, the general population ages, um, because we, we do have, of course, always more women in the older age groups. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, Birgit, any parting thoughts? No, I, I, you know, I hope I can, uh, I was able to um, raise some discussion points. I hope that people uh, will start to think a little bit more about uh, aging, aging in a positive way. Um, mm -hmm. I know that I preach to, you know, uh, the people who are listening in are uh, probably all converted already. Um, but, um, you know, just to raise awareness and to, to um, kind of start uh, a deeper uh, conversation about um, how we perceive our older adults and how can we promote, um, you know, the opportunities that older adults uh, should have and have in the future. Right. Great. Uh, okay, we're getting another comment here. Uh, I hope the media interviews your speakers about this important information. So uh, let's hope that that does happen. Yeah, I think media, that's a, yes, yes a very good point. Great. All right. So, Birgit, thank you so much for um, taking the time to present uh, this very interesting uh, information to us. Uh, we really appreciate it on behalf of everyone at the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging and our listeners. Thanks again. And uh, I'd just like to, before we conclude the webinar today. Uh, we have another webinar coming up uh, and it is on December 4th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time and Professor Heather Keller from University of Waterloo will be talking about older Canadians, food intake and nutritional status, how the CLSA will advance knowledge. So um, once again, Birgit, thank you very much and uh, Everyone, please take note of the next CLSA webinar. We will endeavor to schedule one or two more webinars uh, before uh, Professor Keller's December talk. Thank you very much again, everyone, and Birgit, and have a great afternoon.